Reporting live from the Canadian Embassy in Washington, U.S. President Donald Trump passed by this very spot about an hour ago. And you're looking at the Capitol building where he gave his inaugural address. That is the inaugural parade. It con continues down Pennsylvania Avenue all the way past the White House. Welcome to a special edition of Power at Politics. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Well, it's come. Donald Trump is now president. And as the parade wraps up and the inaugural balls begin, we'll bring you all the sights and sounds from Washington Live as they unfold over the next couple of hours. But there's lots to dig into in terms of what Donald Trump says and what he uh, might mean for Canada. He has said today that he'll follow two simple rules for his presidency. Buy American, hire American. Take a look. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. So that inaugural address by the president laid out a picture of a broken America over the past eight years and many promises to fix. We'll have lots of reaction, particularly from Canadian cabinet ministers to today's events. But let's begin with the CBC's Lindsay Duncombe. Okay, Lindsay, so that was a snippet of the speech, but what were some of the highlights from Trump's message to the American people and to the world today? This was a remarkably populist speech, Rosemary. Uh, Donald Trump talked about the fact that this was the time for the people to take back Washington. He referred to the fact that the establishment protected itself, but not the citizens. This was a message to all of those people who came out to all of those rallies, who cheered when he said, drain the swamp. Donald Trump telling those supporters today they won't be forgotten. Here's what he had to say. January 20th, 2017 will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. And the other key point about what Donald Trump said was really a notion that the rest of the world should be on notice, that the United States is going to look out for its own interests first. Donald Trump broke that down with respect to trade, with respect to the money it spends in other parts of the world. So in addition to being an incredibly populist speech, this was an incredibly nationalistic speech. Here's what that that sounded like. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Okay, one of the things, Lindsay, that uh, he, he did need to do, of course, was send some sort of message to all of America, even those that didn't vote for him, about how he was going to unite the country. How did he fare on that front? Well, he said the words, Rosemary, but I don't know if it had the desired effect. He said, we all bleed the same patriotic blood. But what the speech didn't do was express any understanding for the reasons behind the divisions that characterized the campaign. He didn't acknowledge any of the fears or trepidation that so many Americans, you know, he lost the popular vote, have about this moment. He was able to tap into the anger of his supporters, but he didn't even attempt to tap into the, the fear and the anger on the other side of things. And what was remarkable to me is as we watched, you know, sort of official efforts of healing, which included the uh, going through the rituals of handing over power, Barack Obama, so 
incredibly harsh against Donald Trump in the campaign in the last several months, changing that tone entirely. Hillary Clinton sitting on the stage um, with a, a smile on her face. That was the official way things were done. I was standing out in the crowd, and when you saw Hillary Clinton's smiling face on the jumbotron, People were booing in the crowds. People yeah. booed Chuck Schumer. There was a real sense that the campaign-style anger that fueled Donald Trump to the presidency still exists among his supporters. Okay, Lindsay, thanks for that. That's the CBC's Lindsay Denko, not far from where I am here in Washington. Well, uh, you're still watching on your screen there. You can see uh, the inaugural parade as it makes its way down the very long Pennsylvania Avenue. The president, the vice president, will at some point uh, stand out and watch as the parade goes by. And then they'll head off to at least three inaugural balls tonight. And we'll bring you all that as it unfolds live. But obviously, we want to dig into what this means, what this means for us as, as the United States neighbor and biggest trading partner. Donald Trump says that every decision he makes on trade, on immigration, on foreign policy will be the, for the benefit of the American worker, the American people. Canada has sent several key cabinet ministers down for the inauguration, including Canada's new foreign affairs minister, Christia Freeland. What does she make of the president's very protectionist rhetoric? I asked her that a little bit earlier today. Minister, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. It's great to be with you. Okay, so you listened to that speech as well as I did. When the, the president says it's America first, we want to buy American and create American jobs. What do you say? think about that? You know, as Canada's foreign minister, for me, it's Canada first. Um, it's my job to put the interests of Canadians first, and that's what I do every single day. And I don't think we should be surprised if the leaders of other countries feel the same responsibility to their voters. So you don't see uh, those kinds of comments and the rest of the speech as a sort of insular, in, inside-looking America that is about to descend upon us, and not an America that looks outwards in the way that Canada does. Look, Rosie, I think that it is a surprise to no Canadians that President Trump has given a different speech from the kind of speeches that we're used to hearing from Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, we are two different countries. Uh, we have different values. We've elected different governments. But that in no way precludes Canada having an effective, business-like, mutually beneficial working relationship with this administration. That's something the Prime Minister and our whole team has been laying the foundation for ahead of today. And I am really confident we will be able to build that kind of a relationship with the United States. Okay, one of the things that he set out immediately on the website, the White House website was, you know, we're going uh, re to reopen NAFTA, and if we don't get what we want, we're out. H how do you think those conversations are going to start, and how do you make sure you keep them at the table? Because obviously, okay, we, we, we're happy to have a conversation, but we don't want them to walk away from it, I don't think. Well, you know, Rosie, I have some experience with walking away from the negotiating table and trade deals, and I think, you know, we always have to be ready for that and ready to do it ourselves. Um, again, you know, when it comes to NAFTA, uh, we said from day one, our ambassadors said right after the U.S. election, that we were prepared to talk about modernizing NAFTA, improving it. There have been nearly a dozen meaningful changes to NAFTA since it was first concluded, and so we're looking forward to those conversations. From the conversations that I've had here in the past couple of days with lots of uh, high-placed Canadians and Americans too, they all agree that there is sort of a level of education that needs to be done. They don't quite understand some of the things that we're worried about, and, and how much do you think your job will be that? Again, I think this is very familiar to Canadians. The reality of the Canada-US relationship, and look, I think all of us know this from our American friends. I remember from when I went to university in the States. Um, discovering that I knew a lot more about the United States than my American friends knew about Canada. That's the reality of being a smaller country yeah. next door to a really big one. So, for sure, I think that a big part of my job, and this is a whole of government approach, Minister Sajjan is here, yeah. Minister Carr is here, Andrew Leslie is here, a job for all of us right now 
is explaining to this new administration precisely how strong, how mutually beneficial, and truly how balanced the Canada-U.S. relationship is. We've started that job, and that's something that we're really going to continue intensively in the days to come. But through a different lens, would you agree, than what you had to do with the previous administration? I mean, they've been around a long time, but th yeah, this, this we, lens has to be more business, economic, you know, here's what's in it for you kind of thing. I was trade minister, so my focus um, was and really continues to be a lot on the economy. Um, I really think with this administration, you, you know, one area of common ground that did come through in the new president's speech is, did, did you catch his focus on the middle class? He used those words and he talked about middle class jobs. Well, I noticed the prime minister used those words in his statement too. Right, not and, coincidentally, and not coincidentally, I'm sure, yeah. and that's not that's not a new focus. Yeah, you know, no. that I would say, if you ask the prime minister, what is his single core focus? I am sure he would say jaw, great jobs for the middle class and those working hard to join in. And there was a real similarity there in what the president, the new president said. I keep wanting to say president-elect. I know, I know, I get it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that that is going to be the key area where we find common ground. The other area where I think we're going to find common ground, we heard the new president talking about security. Uh, talking about safety for Americans and something that I think Americans really appreciate is they have the longest undefended border in the world with us. We are great neighbors to have for them. Yeah. They're great neighbors to have for us too. Sure. But I think, you know, really making sure this new administration understands uh, how good it is to have Canada as a neighbor is an important job for us. What about uh, this administration's approach to international world alliances? They seem much more interested in sort of direct transactional relationships with countries, right? You know, here's, here's our relationship with Canada, here it is with Mexico. Not so interested in the United Nations, NATO, other, other things where we would all get together and participate together. And that is something that Canada is committed to. Yeah, I mean, I didn't hear anything directly about that in the new president's speech today and we'll be waiting and listening. It's certainly the case and something I'd like to you know, really say clearly to Canadians and to anyone outside Canada who's listening to us is Canada remains an absolutely committed multilateralist. Uh, we have a long history of believing in, of shaping, of founding international institutions. We're proud to do that. I think as a middle power that really serves our national interest. And also, you know, as the Prime Minister said at the UN, we're Canada, we're here to help. I think we really believe that as a country, and multilateral institutions are a place we can do that. But will we pick up the slack if we have to? Well, let's see what the new administration does. We, we didn't hear anything about that in this speech, so let's see. I'm looking forward to working with Rex Tillerson, yeah. who, if he is confirmed as Secretary of State. You've spoken to him already? No, not yet. Okay. Um, I, I was talking to a couple of the ambassadors from Latvia, from Ukraine, who you know very well, of course, who say that they are hoping that you and, and, and the government at writ large can be sort of a go-between for them to remind the United States why our presence over there militarily is so important and, and, and talk about the, the dangers and the potential dangers from Russia. Are you willing to take on that role? Is that something you think you can do? You know, America is an important, a key friend and ally of the United States. And as our friend and ally, we have a lot of conversations with the United States, both directly with the United States and also as a NATO ally. So, you know, of course, we look forward to and we will have those discussions with the United yeah. States and, and we'll explain our point of view. Okay. We'll leave it there. Lots of work ahead. Good luck. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, so it's now official, obviously, as of today, Donald Trump is the 45th President of the United States. We've got lots of reaction ahead, and we'll bring you all the live events as they continue to unfold, even with helicopters in the background here in Washington over the next few hours. But first, in case you missed part of how this day unfolded, let's take a look at what happened earlier today at that building, the U.S. Capitol, just behind me. Donald John Trump. President, over here. I, Donald John Trump, 
do solemnly swear. Congratulations, Mr. President. It's going to be only America first. Donald John Trump do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability and will to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend preserve protect and defend the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States so help me God so help me God congratulations mr. president yeah. the oath of office I take today is an oath of allegiance to all Americans Hey everybody, welcome back to this special edition of Power and Politics live from the terrace at the Canadian Embassy here in Washington, D.C. As you can see on your screen there, the inaugural parade continues. That is the now Vice President, Mike Pence, uh, about to, I think, look at some of the members of the military. There are various preparations underway for the inaugural balls, which start in a couple of hours. Uh, we are expecting the President, Donald Trump, to attend at least three of them. 
So we'll be dipping in and out of all this kind of coverage throughout the evening as uh, the vice president and the president get used to their new jobs and, and meet some of their new staff. We'll keep those pictures up for you, of course. Uh, and I should also let you know that here in the United States, the U.S. Senate has just confirmed General James Mattis as the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and in his speech, President Donald Trump promised to focus on rebuilding America's military and said his country has been, quote, subsidizing other countries' defenses. So what does that mean for our U.S. allies? Here's Donald Trump arriving now. I'm not sure exactly where he is, if he's at the White House already. I would think that I would think that yes, that's what it looks like. He's just coming out there with the first lady, Melania Trump, as they make their way generally to a, a viewing box or a box here on the lawn where they will uh, look at the military. And we'll just keep keep holding those pictures there. Reporter yelling at him there, how does it feel to be the 45th president of the United States? He gave his classic thumbs up. All right, we'll keep an eye on these pictures and, and ask the question about how this president, this administration, will approach uh, defense policy, the American military, and perhaps more particularly some of the international alliances that bring peace and security to the world, including NATO. I, some, earlier I put some of those questions to our defense minister, Harjit Sajjan, who's in Washington. Minister, thanks for joining us. Great, thank you for having Nice to me. see you here in D.C. Uh, what, what are your expectations around how this new administration is going to approach security and defense? Do you think we're going to see uh, a harder line on some of those issues than we had seen perhaps under President Obama? Well, we have a, a, a very long and uh, in-depth uh, relationship that extends back uh, right from uh, uh, way back from World War I. And we have a very good uh, integrated uh, relationship, I mean, from everything from NORAD uh, for the amount of other work that we do sure. and, and some of our international operations. So moving, moving forward, um, these are some of the things that we will continue. And so we've been very fortunate because of that uh, uh, very integrated relationship that we have. We'll continue that. But we will also look at any new uh, threats and challenges uh, that before us and, and uh, continue that uh, through some really good dialogue. What about NATO? What about this ongoing talk from the, the now president that NATO is obsolete, needs to be modernized? He's not so interested in defending his allies. He wants to keep America safe. What, what do you think of that? That's that's is that troubling? It seems troubling. No, well, when it comes, to, Canada is committed uh, to NATO. NATO plays a, a very important important role. Um, but there's always efficiencies that we all need to uh, work towards. Uh, when we get together as uh, defense uh, ministers at, the, uh, at NATO, we talk about where are the efficiencies that we can create. And those are good conversations to have because it what, makes What are efficiencies? Uh, well, in terms of internally, how money, uh, how, uh, money is spent and how we tackle with uh, certain threats and how do we support other, um, uh, other operations. Uh, these are very important issues. And NATO is, a, when you put all the nations together, it's a significant uh, alliance that uh, is beneficial for all our security. But, but, but I think the new president is looking for more money from us. In fact, the previous president was looking for it too. So what, I mean, wouldn't the first request to us be, why don't you up your contribution to, to the NATO alliance as we promised to do? Well, the NATO alliance, we're actually the sixth largest contributor to, uh, to, to NATO. When it comes time to look def def um, uh, investing in our military, uh, we had launched a defense policy review, which is going to be uh, announced uh, shortly, uh, um, early this year. Um, we are committed uh, uh, to, to our military. That's why one of the reasons we stepped up uh, in Iraq, um, also in, in NATO. But it's not about how much you just spend. It's about what you do, your output. And that's very critical. And also, what are you doing to investing in modernizing your military? And that's something that we uh, have committed to as well. I, I would imagine you're hearing the same things I'm hearing from the ambassadors in Ottawa. You're hearing it probably from their, your counterparts. Latvia, Ukraine, uh, you know, anywhere in Eastern Europe, they are concerned. Uh, the American troops are in Poland now. That's fine. We are heading to Latvia. But they are concerned that this talk about NATO, which is so central to their security, will somehow be destabilizing. Are you reassuring them in some way? 
what we're committed to to do. We're going to continue on with our mission. Our planning is going extremely well. Um, um, and our support for the Ukraine uh, yeah. will always be strong. Uh, we, we have uh, troops on the ground there. We're going to be uh, um, uh, coming up in the, with the mission renewal uh, as, as well. No decision has been made in terms of what needs to be done, but I can assure you our Canada support for the Ukraine will always be there and what, very strong. What is happening with the peacekeeping decision? Has this been delayed because of the change administration here? Oh, it would, as I stated, it's, it's a if we're going to have a, 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 a substantial impact, we've got to make sure that we take the time um, to look at all the, the, the various factors, and, uh, and that's what, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, there is, you know, we can't set a date to be able to say exactly when to make the decision. As new information uh, comes up, we want to make sure that we can have the, the right contributions, and uh, and we will. But I thought you were pretty close to making a decision. I, I'm pretty sure you had said to me by the end of the year. Here we are, almost at the end of January, and I'm wondering if our allies, as they see this talk happening in this capital, and then we haven't moved on this decision, is that not troublesome or have you told them it's coming well we were hopeful um, I'm always hopeful to get it done by the uh, the end of the year as, as we were as a government but at the same time Canadians expect us to making sure that we make a responsible uh, decision and we want to make sure that we weigh all the factors look at um, all aspects of where not only with the UN but what are we doing also uh, around the world but it, it is what is happening in this country one of the factors that you're now having to consider in a different way but in terms of the wider context we look at it from a complete uh, uh, complete defense relationships that's something that that we do consider and we look at all our decisions uh, from a defense relationship uh, perspective and, and that's a prudent thing to do when, I, I, I get when that. a new administration comes in but but so are you saying to me though that the peacekeeping decision is on hold or the announcement is on hold while you figure out what the United States is looking at and what sort of decisions they're going to make? I mean, that might make sense, but no, is right. that what's happening? No, that's particularly exactly what the, what the new administration is going about. But, I mean, it, it does play into a factor in terms of because each mission and what we do around the world, as I stated before, is not done in, in independence. For sure. example, what we're doing in Iraq is directly related to what's happening, uh, what our contributions and what we're uh, eventually will be doing uh, in other parts of the of world. Course. So all those factors need to be taken into account, of course, uh, when it comes to a new administration, that we need to take that into account. But we need to look at other aspects uh, as well. But when we, when, as I always stated, is we'll make the decision when we're absolutely certain that we can achieve the objectives that uh, uh, we've set the mission up for. And so at this point, wh when do you think that timeline is? You're going to wait and see how things unfold here with your counterpart and then make a firm decision on, on the peacekeeping mission. And again, uh, I'm not gonna, I can't put a date uh, to, to the decision just yet. Um, obviously, it's, it's very important to, to be able to start discussions uh, with, uh, with the U.S. and I look forward to meeting my counterpart uh, when the process uh, uh, has, has gone through. And we need to be able to discuss a lot of the changes within, uh, even with, within our allies as well. But at the end of the day, when a decision is made, we want to make sure that we have an impact. And just like the decisions when we made in Iraq, uh, we took our time sure. for it, but it had a substantial impact, which we are seeing uh, today. Okay, I, I don't mean to be difficult on this, but just so I understand, are we still interested in being a part of a peacekeeping mission somewhere in the world, or is that off the table too? Uh, we are, uh, when it comes to our role uh, with multilateral uh, organizations, uh, uh, the new peace operations, is, is, is it's extremely important. Because it's all those operations are not done in isolations as a state. No, I get it. There's certain missions that are done. It may not be done for a coalition or a NATO context, but also other missions prevent um, uh, uh, recruiting and dealing with uh, security challenges in other ways. And it's important for us to do that. And we'll making sure before we make that decision, we look at all the, all the factors. But the UN mission that we were going to announce by the end of the year or soon. Uh, seemed like it was going to happen in northern Africa. Is that still going to happen or is you are waiting now to see how it unfolds? Just so I'm perfectly clear on this. Well, we will we'll be perfectly, everybody will be perfectly clear once we actually make the announcement and, uh, and demonstrate why we made that choice. But we want to make sure it's taken the, the time to look at all, 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 all the factors. I was hopeful to make it by the, the end of the year as, as our, our government was. Um, but we want to make sure that we take the exact prudent time to, to make sure it's, we, we assess all the situations. And then also there's a, there's a significant amount of uh, work that needs to be uh, done uh, for our, our, our planning as well. I'm very happy with the, what's, what's, what's gone on so far. And we have a little bit more integration uh, to do as well. As also, I'll be looking forward to working with the new um, uh, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Minister, Mr. Uh, uh, Freeland, yeah. as we look at um, and having the same discussions that I uh, used to have with Minister Young. I look forward sure. to having the discussions with her.
Uh, last question, and this is on the uh, Vice Admiral Norman, just because I haven't had a chance to talk to you about it. I know the RCMP is investigating, but we have done some reporting that this was around the leaking of procurement documents around shipbuilding. This would have been when he was head of the Navy. Why are we not being more transparent? Why is, are you and the government not being more transparent about what actually happened and whether we should be concerned about a security breach? Well, it's very important. I, I, I will not discuss uh, or confirm or deny any type of uh, when it comes to what the RCMP uh, are, are, are doing. All I can assure you and Canadians is that uh, I support General Vance's uh, decision on, on this mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, you know, uh, the decisions that he makes, it makes for the, uh, for the betterment of the Canadian Armed Forces. And uh, you know, and, and uh, in, 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 in time, we'll be able to talk about it. And it's not a, it's not a security issue with our allies. It's an internal security issue. No, it's, it is not a security issue okay. um, uh, for, for our allies. And we have a very good, very actually extremely robust relationship with with our with, with our allies uh, on things. And but I can assure you that uh, and give uh, confidence to Canadians that uh, both myself and the Prime Minister support uh, General Vance's decision on this. Okay. Minister, good of you to make the time. Thank Great, you. Great, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. We'll have more reaction from the Canadian government coming up in the show. But first, let's look at these pictures live. The president and vice president saluting the military. This is the inaugural parade. And that right there is the presidential reviewing stand where the president and vice president, their families and special guests are uh, standing there or sitting in front of the White House to watch the parade that started down where I am and it's made its way all the way down Pennsylvania Avenue towards the White House. From there, once the parade wraps up, uh, everyone will get gussied up for some of the inaugural balls that will happen throughout the city tonight. The president expected to attend three or so of them. But for now, he and his family watching the parade that is there in their honor. We'll keep an eye on that when we get back. Uh, oh, first, I'll show you some pictures of the president as he stepped out from his car. Uh, as presidents have done now since 1977 when Jimmy Carter did it for the first time. Jimmy Carter, who was at the inaugura uh, inauguration today. And President Trump walked alongside his motorcade, too, with his son, Barron, and his wife, Melania. The security, a sight to see, a sight to behold. Our chief correspondent, Peter Mansbridge, will join us after this short break. Stay there.
Welcome back to a special edition of Power and Politics live from the Canadian Embassy in Washington, where you can hear some of the military bands still making their way down Pennsylvania Avenue to where the president is. Uh, the president, President Trump, we'll have to get used to saying that, it's only been a couple of hours, is at the presidential reviewing stand outside the White House, watching the inaugural parade with some of his family members. Uh, with me now to watch some of this and tell us his impressions of the day, uh, the CBC's chief correspondent, Peter Mansbridge. I didn't ask you how many inaugurations you've done. You love it when I ask you stuff like that. <laughs> it's, uh, too many. Too many. Um, you know, a few, but the ones that, you know, the one, this, the Obama one stood, stood out. out because yeah. it was such yeah. a huge crowd and such a momentous occasion. Right. You know? So that, that was a pretty big deal. Reagan was a, really? was a big one, too, because there was, um, in some ways, it was kind of like this in terms of the concern. There were people who thought, oh, my God, we're going to be in a nuclear war the next day. A Hollywood actors running the country. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there was a lot of concern uh, around that. But uh, the Obama one was the big one. Uh, so, so given that, what was there anything today that surprised you as you watched here from, from our listening perch? Well, you know, for a guy who drew crowds all the way through the campaign and big crowds, yeah. this was kind of a bus crowd-wise. You know, I, I haven't seen the official count in terms of the inauguration ceremony, but the numbers that are being tossed around in social media from legitimate newspapers are 250,000, which sounds like a lot when you first hear it, but when you say, well, Obama got two million, and this guy was supposed to bring a big crowd. It wasn't great weather today, but it wasn't as bad as no. the Obama day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, even look there, the bleachers. Yeah, the bleachers all along this. Yeah. Now, this parade is running way late. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't yeah. supposed to be in the dark, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you, you know, that's not good. But even your favorite band, the Bikers for Trump band, <laughs> yeah. that we're uh, playing not far from here, I never saw more than 20 people watching them. Yeah. So if Not it was good. supposed to mobilize the American people, it maybe hasn't done that. Well, it didn't mobilize them here. They, no. they didn't come here. But a lot of Trump from Trump land uh, people may, you know, may well couldn't have afforded the, uh, you yeah. know, the trip here. Yeah. So uh, there you go. I'm sure they're, they're watching in television and had their, uh, had their moments. But I guess on a more substantive level, uh, you know, the, the speech itself, yeah. you know, did I find it surprising? No, I, I actually found it surprising by its lack of surprise. Mm. What do you it mean was, by that? Well, it was kind of his campaign speech way shorter and sort of cleaned up in the, in, in the way it was told. Sure. Uh, but for the most part, many of the same points. No big outreach in terms of, uh, you know, a divided nation. Um, not the kind of speech that one assumes you'll remember 50 years from now. Oh, like that Trump speech, you know, in in, uh, in 2017, and that great line he had about whatever. You know, I yeah. uh, I don't think it's there. You you did make an, uh, an interesting observation earlier in the day because to have the president, president then president, the former president Obama, standing there mm -hmm. as the current president said. The past eight years have been yeah. awful for the country. Right. But what you said was that this that's not unusual necessarily. Well, it, it wasn't unusual for Obama. He must have thought back to eight years ago when he trashed George W. Bush with with the W sitting right beside him. So I think there's some of that you, you kind of expect, especially when you have a change presidency. The guy comes into office yeah. after promising. We're going to, it's all going to be different. We're going to make America great again, which for all the fuss about the slogan is really not that new a slogan. You know, you, you kind of have that. A lot of people have had that slogan from all parties. Yeah. Um, but uh, so when, when when Trump, as we see him here, uh, you know, made, uh, you know, said some pretty disparaging stuff about the last eight years, he was really uh, doing to Obama what Obama had done to Bush. Now, I don't think he did it because of that. No. I think he believed it. No. And he knows it would rally the base. Same reason Obama had done it. Yeah. When he talked about the carnage that had happened mm -hmm. in, in, in the United States because now, of drugs and Now, that might be games. the line. That may, might be the line yeah, that, that lasts remember. for some time. But the problem with the line is you've got to deliver it. Like, n not in the moment, but you've got to deliver the promise yeah. of you're going to end the carnage. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought about the expectations game. There, there was no attempt to manage expectations in that no. speech. No. Just to keep them high. No, exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Okay. Uh, Peter will have more coverage tonight.
right from this spot, this chair, in fact, on the National. And he'll be back tomorrow, apparently, too, for there's a big women's march, a big protest tomorrow as well. All right. Uh, of course, the National is at CBC News Network at 9 p.m. You can watch at 10 on your CBC local station. Donald Trump. As uh, Peter mentioned there, an enthusiastic base of supporters, but not everyone in Washington is celebrating. About 95 protesters now have been arrested after protests erupt in the Capitol today. We'll have more on that after this break and continue to bring you all the live coverage as festivities continue here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. Welcome back to Power and Politics, broadcasting live from Washington, D.C. Lots of festivities and events continuing at this hour to inaugurate Donald Trump as president. Trump has focused, of course, on trying to bring Americans a little bit together in his speech today, but unity wasn't on display in the Capitol, where protesters clashed with police at a number of locations. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick is at the National Building Museum. One of the inaugural balls is taking place there tonight. Uh, that's a lovely backdrop, Megan, but she's going to tell us more about some of the protests that unfolded today and the people that were behind them. 
Yeah, they started early this morning, Rosie, uh, continuing on from last night when they actually started. I saw some of the protest action on my way home last night. And this morning there were protesters mostly stationed at some of the security checkpoints where people were trying to make their way down to the mall to take in uh, the swearing-in ceremony. I saw people this morning, they had their arms linked, uh, sort of forming a human barricade, but they were ch chanting, holding signs, uh, very peaceful. Uh, but later in the morning, things uh, did get a little out of hand. A few blocks away from the White House, the action was sort of centered around one main intersection. And there were some demonstrators there who were throwing rocks at police. Uh, there was some smashing of windows of a Starbucks and some other uh, businesses, uh, some things lit on fire. Uh, so the police had to use uh, various tactics to disperse the crowd. They were using various sprays and other tactics to try and push the crowds back. Uh, some I wasn't there on scene at that location, Rosie, but I was reading some of the coverage and some of the demonstrators were saying they were simply intent on disrupting the celebratory mood. Uh, but others there, of course, peaceful and just wanted to uh, protest the election of Donald Trump. And they were saying that they feel like their cause is being undermined by that violence. Now, police said there were more than 95 arrests. Uh, there was one police officer injured, some bystanders injured as well. Uh, so we'll see how things go the rest of the evening. But there are definitely people out there in the street protesting. Okay, and as we continue to watch the parade that is unfolding there in front of the presidential reviewing stand, which is located just outside the White House where the president and the vice president are with their families, but there is a big protest and we are expecting it to be fairly large tomorrow. Give us a sense of what, what that is, Megan. Yeah, there'll be tens of thousands of people in the streets again tomorrow for the Women's March, which is an event that was born uh, literally, I think it was the day after the election, uh, in reaction to it, in reaction to Donald Trump being elected. And then it grew into this big movement and a large event. Uh, and they are expecting about 200,000 people down on the mall tomorrow. It starts around 10 a.m. Uh, there'll be a stage set up there, a bit of a rally with speakers. And we're expecting a few celebrities to come to town for that, Rosie, including people like uh, Amy Schumer, Katy Perry, Gloria Stein. Dynam is expected to speak as well. Uh, so they'll be rallying down there for a few hours uh, and then uh, marching through the streets of downtown Washington. And there are literally busloads of people on their way to D.C. right now for that event tomorrow. Okay, and I should let viewers know we're about an hour behind schedule at this stage. The parade was expected to wrap up at around 6 p.m. Eastern. It is ongoing now, so I would imagine that's also going to cause delays for the inaugural balls where, uh, where you're located there, Megan. What kind of stuff do we know about mm -hmm. how those events, those celebratory uh, moments are going to unfold tonight? So there's three official balls tonight. There's lots of parties going on, but there are three events that were actually organized by the presidential inaugural committee, it's called. Uh, two of them are happening at a different location uh, from here. They're happening at the convention center, just a few blocks away. And those ones are titled the Liberty Ball and the Freedom Ball. The one that we're at right now at the National Building Museum is a salute to the armed services ball. So here the invited guests will be veterans uh, currently serving armed uh, members of the armed services and their families and guests. Uh, and Donald Trump is expected to show up at all three balls. And as per tradition, uh, the uh, president and first lady usually do a dance. It's kind of like a wedding ceremony, you know, the first dance. And <laughs> that I'm expecting to happen on the, that oval right behind me. It's quite a beautiful building here. Um, and we have been hearing that they're expected to dance to My Way, uh, made famous by Frank Sinatra, of course. Uh, and you never know what can happen at these parties. Back at one of Bill Clinton's inaugural events, he actually got up on stage with the band and started playing saxophone. Uh, there is going to be some musical entertainment here tonight. I wasn't too familiar with any of the names, but other people might be. Uh, Jason Weathers, a singer-songwriter from Texas. Uh, Tony Orlando, another singer. So there'll be musical entertainment later in the night, but of course uh, everyone will be anticipating the arrival of the new president and first lady. But a lot fewer celebrities than there were for Obama, that's for sure. And sometimes that's what makes for good people Definitely. watching, that it'll be other kind of people watching yeah. what we'll be doing tonight. Okay, Megan, yeah, we'll so check back with you later. Yeah, here. We'll, we're waiting yeah. for the guests to come in. Okay, all right. good. Thanks. We'll check back with you from there. Thanks, Megan. Appreciate it. We're going to bring you all the sights and sounds from the stuff there that Megan's talking about to the parade as it continues to unfold. Much delayed. Oh, Mike Pence is having a great old time. I should call him the vice president now. Uh, a special inauguration power panel is coming up next. Paul Wells and Aaron Wary holding down the fort in uh, Ottawa. Here with me in Washington, Louisa Savage and Alex Panetta. They're all up next. Stick around.
From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. We will follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Power and Politics from Washington, D.C. We're keeping an eye on uh, the inaugural parade. There you see the president and his son, Barron, as they walk. Oh, oddly, a tractor is going by. That's part of the parade as well. Um, those are just some of the events unfolding, way delayed as things turn out before the president and uh, his wife make their way to a number of inaugural balls. We'll keep an eye on that. It's a whole tractor parade, things you wouldn't expect to see. Uh, but we did hear from the, the president today a pretty clear message. His focus is going to be about putting America first. So how will that approach to governing affect Canada? That's the, our favorite question on this show. And what does it mean for politics even around the globe? Trying to bring in a special inauguration power panel in our Ottawa studio holding down the fort. National affairs columnist for the Toronto Star, Paul Wells, alongside the CBC's Aaron Weary. Hi, fellas. Hi. Hello. Uh, here with me in D.C., but I never get to see them, so this is fun. Uh, Alex Panetta of the Canadian Press and Louisa Savage of Politico. Usually it's the reverse, so this is nice. Nice to see you. So I'm going to start with them, you guys, just to make you feel awkward and, and lonely over there. Uh, I'll start with you, Louisa. This, this whole buy America, hire America, what should it mean for people who aren't American? <laughs> Well, I think the first thing you'll see is, is Trump getting into a negotiation about NAFTA. I mean, that he's made that very clear. And a lot of president, presidential candidates have talked about doing that, and he's sure. actually going to do it. Um, so it's very interesting. We, we've spent the day today talking to Trump advisors, and they all said, you know, don't listen too closely to what he says. Wait and see what he does, because so much of what he says, in their view, is a negotiating position. Mm. So some of his more extreme statements and confusing statements are, are apparently not to be taken too literally, but I think it's clear that trade, particularly how it affects manufacturing, is incredibly important to Donald Trump. I was so struck in his speech day when he talked about um, the rusted out factories littering the countryside like tombstones and, and talking about this um, incredibly devastated country, which I, I don't think a lot of people in Washington think of the country in those terms. But that's clearly been his preoccupation throughout. That's how he campaigned. It's how he was elected, and it'll be foremost in his mind. So whether it's talking about um, what percentage of automobiles and NAFTA, what percentage of the parts are made in North yeah. America or in the United States, that, that'll all be top of mind. And if he does manage to bring Congress along and launch a big uh, infrastructure package, I'm sure there will be a lot of buy American, hire American rules that they'll try to put in there. Paul, what do you make of that? That, the, that that's just talk for now. We should just wait and see what he says. Because when someone says buy American, hire American, I'm like, OK, well, that sounds like something you're going to do. And, and, and we should be worried. What do you think, Paul? Well, one thing that strikes me is that so far it is only talk and not action. I mean, there are still several hours left in the day. but. As a candidate, this guy, this guy uh, made a lot of pronouncements about the things he would do on day one, from day one, bigly. And uh, I'm not, I haven't heard of any executive orders being signed. I haven't heard of any directives going out to the diplomatic corps or anything else. So far, um, it, it's just the kind of the pageantry that we see on the screen. Um, I doubt that we'll have to wait very long if he means anything by anything he has said, because it is true that his inaugural speech today was a stark repetition of the discourse of the campaign. He, if there's anyone left in the world who's still hoping he'll pivot uh, to, to a moderate stance, um, I, I think the speech today made short work of that. You've listened to lots of those speeches. Did that also strike you, that it sounded very similar to what he was saying on the campaign trail? Yeah, it was pretty consistent. And I'd say before we breathe a sigh of relief about him not doing anything that might adversely affect trade through executive orders, let's give him a chance to enter the White House. I think he hasn't got, gotten to his desk yet. <laughs> uh, let's give him a, give him well, Paul, did, Paul <laughs> said there were some hours in the day left, <laughs> so he can still yeah, do Let's it. give him a couple hours yeah. at the yeah. desk. Um, uh, but no, it was, it was very much in keeping with, uh, with, his, uh, with his, his campaign uh, uh, messaging. And uh, it was the most nationalist message I've ever heard a, a Western politician give in, in, a, in a formal setting like this. And you know, one of the things I found fascinating is 
over the last few years, there's been this debate now about what you know globalization, what role it's playing in uh, a loss of jobs, manufacturing jobs versus robots. Uh, you know, Islamic uh, terrorism, which you referred to as well. How much of uh, uh, much of that has to do with a more interconnected world? And now he's saying that okay, we're going to manage to sort of seal off the borders and protect ourselves from these things. Well, we'll find out whether that's even in any way possible. Whether mm -hmm. it's in terms of uh, uh, terrorism, whether it's in terms of bringing yeah. trade jobs back, is that possible in a world where we speak to each other very quickly? Yeah, I mean, I I, oh. I wrote something this morning about how everyone I talked to had seemed to have a real insular view of things in in America, and it seemed like that's where he's going, Trump. But Alex, um, Aaron, but but uh, Alex makes the point that that might not even be possible in today's world. So he can say that. But maybe he doesn't understand how difficult it would be to unwind those kinds of things. Yeah, I suspect that's actually part of the Canadian hope or, or argument yeah. at this point is that there's so much trade, there's so much commerce between the two countries that, you know, to slap by America provisions on, to slack, slap a, a border adjustment tax on, that those things would do such significant harm to the American economy and to American workers that, uh, the Trump administration would essentially have to, to back down or make some exception for Canadian products to do that. You know, the Canadian the Canadian uh, government and officials have been sort of stressing this over and over again that, you know, how much trade goes on, how many states are dependent on, on trade with Canada and so on and so on. Uh, and I think that is, that goes to a, another thing which is, has been this idea that I think Alex is getting at that as much as Trump has talked about certain ideas and certain things he wants to do, that eventually it will run up against reality. Um, you know, arguably that was sort of the argument against his campaign too, that uh, it would eventually run up against reality and that didn't happen. Uh, we'll see whether uh, in terms of actually public policy and, and governance and, and international affairs, uh, whether that is something that is a bit more complex than, than winning a political contest. Louisa wants back in. Well, I, I wanted to say that I think the reality this um, brushes up against, in fact, is, is the United States Congress, in part. Um, what was so striking to me about that speech is it was not a conservative or Republican speech. It was very populist. And there are a lot of things that Trump doesn't control. So, for example, uh, so much of trade policy and tariffs has to go through um, the, the Congress. It has to go through um, the, the tax reform that, that the Republicans want to get going as well. Um, and so he is going to be in this very interesting position. He's almost like a third party candidate that's taken over yeah. the Republican Party. Um, you'll see him come out of the gate, I would expect, uh, by nominating a very conservative Supreme Court justice. And that would galvanize uh, Republicans in the Congress and conservatives around the country behind him. And at the same time, he's going to have to grapple with what Republicans are trying to do, which is repeal Obamacare. And it's so unclear what will replace that. Republicans want something much smaller, much less interventionist. On the other hand, he's talked about giving health care to everybody, which sounds very socialist. So Obamacare added 20 million people got insurance. Um, Five million of those, from what I've read, were, were Trump voters. So they're going to be directly affected. So that sets up an interesting tension. If he wants to do infrastructure, if he wants to get spending, which he talked about in his speech, particularly for the Rust Belt, yeah. um, that sets up a tension. So there's a reality check just right behind us on Capitol Hill in terms of what he can push. And he's coming in as a fairly unpopular yeah. president-elect. His approval ratings are unusually low for a newly elected president who's supposed to be on a honeymoon. So does he have the country behind him if he opposes Congress? Do they fear his supporters? Or is it the other way around, that they try to run this unconventional president and turn him into a more traditional conservative? And the last thing I would add is his cabinet picks so far have been pretty much um, conservative Republicans. So yeah. that is giving a lot of reassurance to people on the Hill. But but he still remains the president. So we'll see. Uh, Alex, last word, and then I'll take a break. Yeah, I, I, just, I think he's got a tremendous amount of power. He's got, I think, something like 74 percent approval among Republicans. And this country is so bitterly divided. And I saw it on the mall. I'll maybe tell some stories about things I, I heard from people in the crowd. It's so bitterly divided that all you need is basically 60 percent support of 50 percent of America's political parties. And you've got a lot more power than you would have traditionally. I think he can probably get a lot done as long as Republican, the Republican grassroots is still on his side. Okay, the inaugural parade continues. Aaron and Paul, when we get back, I'm just going to leave this seed with you. I want to talk about what you thought of the Canadian government's response today, particularly some of the things we heard from uh, our new Minister of Foreign Affairs. Our special power panel continues after this break. Stay there. Color guards from Lansing, Michigan are making their third appearance in an inaugural parade.
Paul Wells, Aaron Weary, as uh, festivities continue just down the street from us. I just want to go to Ottawa, my, my fellas there, to talk about how uh, this government, the Canadian government, has responded uh, to the speech today and, and even just the, the, the fact that they sent so many cabinet ministers down to try and mix and mingle with people. I don't know if you want to start us off, Paul. Yeah, I mean, uh, Justin Trudeau decided within a few minutes after uh, Trump's uh, election victory was announced on November 8th that uh, he's going to do everything he can to get along with these guys. Uh, I don't, I can't imagine a Canadian prime minister who would have made a different choice. So this means uh, multilateral engagement. Uh, every cabinet minister who's got an obvious file to deal with with their opposite number is going to reach out to them early. Uh, uh, Trudeau's senior staff and Christian Freeland were in Washington, were in New York. Uh, two weeks ago to talk to the transition team uh, and, uh, and and the communique that went out today continues that message. It mm. talked about the deeply intertwined economy, hint, hint, in other words, you can't hurt us without it hurting you. Yeah. And then I was struck though, be partly because they've been reaching out, they've been taking such care to be nice to Donald Trump himself in all their public statements and in private meetings. I was struck by the last line of the communique which uh, goes into all the majestic detail of the multifarious uh, American uh, uh, behemoth. The Congress, the state governors, the mayors. Uh, I, I, I was a little surprised they didn't mention the courts because it may come to that. <laughs> uh, just to remind everyone, including perhaps the president, if someone ever reads the communique to him, that uh, he's not the only game in town. Aaron, what, what do you think of, of the approach? Which I, I, it seems to be... Uh a, a hard sell job because I, I don't know what else it could be right now. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, this, you know, the Canadian government doesn't have the luxury of, of sort of taking pot shots at the Americans or, or you know, taking symbolic stands or, you know, doing anything but trying to look out. I think for for economic interests and trying to make sure that you're going to be on on decent footing as a as a country. Uh, and at the same time, there does seem to be a, a concerted effort to to be present, to be in communication, to get a sense of what's going on. Um, you know, in terms of their, you know, sort of counseling calm and, and trying to sort of move forward cautiously, I think that probably reflects the fact that you can't really know or they can't really know exactly what Donald Trump's going to do until he yeah. starts doing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was an interesting moment in, in uh, Belleville last week where the Prime Minister was doing those town halls when he had that, that kind of flourish where he decided to say, you know, but we'll still stand up for our values. We'll. You know, I'll still call myself a feminist. We'll, I'll still uh, defend immigration. I'll still uh, say that Muslim Canadians have, have made a, a, an important contribution to Canada. I think that was an interesting moment for reassuring some people that maybe oppose Trump that, that Trudeau is still going to be a voice for those things. Uh, but I think you can also go back. Adam Rudwanski, I think, touched on this in the Globe today a bit. You can go back in the Prime Minister's own statements. He's talked about Canada being more of a, uh, uh, a symbol uh, to the world than, than lecturing people on how they're going to do things. Yeah. And, and if you're looking for sort of that Trump-Trudeau uh, 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 difference in contrast, I don't think it's going to be Trudeau, uh, you know, giving statements of outrage every time Trump does something no, that, that no. doesn't that doesn't correspond with with liberal policy. Uh, yeah, and that wouldn't be effective anyway. Uh, Louisa wants back, and then we'll give it yeah, to Alex. So I was going to say, I think an interesting thing for Canada to watch, particularly on the trade side, on the economic side, is not what Trump does, which I'm sure he'll do something on on NAFTA, but not what he does, and not regulations, and not tariffs, but what does the private sector do? Because what he's done incredibly effectively so far, before he even uh, was sworn in, was to use his Twitter as a bully pulpit and to go after individual companies and to say, you know, congratulations to this company who's keeping jobs in the United States. Um, shame on this other company that's outsourcing them and yeah. taking them overseas. And that has sent a, just a shock down uh, corporate America. I mean, CEOs right now, companies, they're very worried about this. They're, they're coming up with Twitter strategies, but they're also coming up with um, how to position themselves as companies that do business, that manufacture, um, and that hire people here in the United States. I think you'll see um, that's going to be a big part of their PR and how they present themselves going forward. And I think this has had just an enormous peer pressure effect, and we're just beginning to see uh, the, the very first stages of it. And I think that is something that, that Canada and other trading partners in the United States should be watching out for. Just how organically the private sector uh, responds to this rhetoric and this bully pulpit that he has. Mr. Panetta. I would, uh, I would say that uh, Canada enters any trade conversation with the United States with an inherent weakness 
and one inherent strength. And the inherent weakness, uh, I saw somebody tweeted uh, here that we, the Americans need us more than we need them. I would respectfully submit that that's not true. Huh. More of our trade, a greater percentage of our trade is to the United States than theirs is to us. A greater percentage of our jobs related to trade are, uh, we have a greater percentage of jobs related to trade with the United States than they have with us. That's our inherent weakness. We arrive at any negotiating table with, 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 with we need them. Um, but the strength is, this building here and uh, is, is, is oozing with points of access for special interest. And now you can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but one of the advantages is when you're going to do stuff that's going to cost jobs, there are a lot of people who are going to put some pressure up there uh, in districts. And I think that one thing the Canadian Embassy has done very well, and one of the reasons it has an embassy here between, next to Congress, is to lobby lawmakers, lobby state governments. They have governor's conferences in this building. And there's a reason for that, yeah. is to get to know everybody. And I think they're going to be, you're going to have a lot of outreach, and you already have had outreach for years preparing for a moment like this. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure from different places. Uh, Paul, you get the last word on that. Um, one line, the, 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 the Trudeau gang already have their lines uh, when it comes to the Americans. One of them is that 35 American states count Canada as their uh, leading trade partner. Uh, that gets to Alex's point that while the, the, the top line number is that, is that the Canadian economy is more dependent on the American economy than vice versa by some distance. There are 35 states where it would hurt if we got into any kind of trade dispute. I actually did the cross-referencing. I'm surprised the Langevin block hasn't done it. 23 of those 35 states voted for Trump, which means that in the Trump heartland, there are people whose jobs depend on Canada. That's a point that will be made as gently and privately as possible many times in the months to come. Okay. That's a good point, so <laughs> we'll end on that one. Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on the inaugural parade as it continues, the beginning of the balls and all the... There's the president talking with people, special guests and family members there as they go off to get ready for these balls. Uh, power panels sticking around to help us walk through more events of the day, particularly the message of real doom and gloom that the new president put out there of what the United States has looked like over the past eight years. But next, Natural Resources Minister Jim Carr is also in Washington today doing some of that outreach we were talking about. What does he think that could mean for Canada's resource exports and our energy strategy? Find out after this. Stay there.
understanding that it is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. Welcome back to Power and Politics, broadcasting live from the terrace of the Canadian Embassy in Washington. It's so nice, I may just stay here. That probably won't go over well. The new president has made it clear that when it comes to energy, and everything else for that matter, he will put America first. The president is vowing also to dial back plans to fight climate change, reduce what he calls burdensome relations on the country's energy industry. What does that mean for us? Are there potential opportunities here for us? I spoke earlier with Natural Resources Minister Jim Carr here in D.C. Here's that conversation. Minister, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, so obviously the, the thing that stood out for Canadians if they were listening to Donald Trump was talk of America first. What do you think that means? Well, it means that he cares about jobs and so do we. <laughs> and if we care together about jobs in the energy sector, then both countries will benefit. It's a highly integrated energy economy in North America. Jobs in Canada in the energy sector are good for Americans and vice versa. So I would take the positive spin on that. Uh, and we have already established good relationships, and they are developing all the time. We will look at what the American administration does. There is an awful lot that's been said a month ago, six months ago, a year ago. Now it's very important for us to begin that very important conversation between the two countries. And in energy, I think that there is room for common ground, and the objective is to find it and then work together in order that we can achieve what we both want, which are good jobs for Canadians and Americans. So when he says that he's committed to energy policies that maximize uh, American resources, d does, that, does that give you pause? Or do you think... It's, I hard, mean, it's, yeah. it's hard to interpret no, I understand. You know, what he Fair. means. Uh, I think what we'll do is uh, be very attentive to policies that are announced by the administration and meanwhile to have the kinds of conversations where Canada can influence those policies. Mm -hmm. And when the President of the United States talks about jobs, uh, the Canadian government says that's our interest too. So how do we establish the kind of energy economy in North we'll America? we jobs on both sides though. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think that that is already the case. Uh, and we have every opportunity to dig even deeper. You, you, I think when you were talking to Peter Mansbridge earlier, you said that you already had relationships with some U.S. Yeah. legislators. Who, who do you know or who might be helpful to you? Uh, Lisa Murkowski, who is the senior Republican senator from Alaska, dropped in on us in Ottawa. Right. She's the chair of the Senate Energy Committee. Good. And her message was, uh, this is a very important relationship for the United States and we want to develop it. We want to make sure that we grow together. So that is the kind of message that I'm hearing from many uh, who have been in transition in the administration, those who sit in Congress and in the Senate, and that mirrors exactly what our interest is. Do you think the fact that the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, was the head of ExxonMobil, do you think that is beneficial to Canada and might well, be beneficial? he understands Canada and he understands the oil industry, and he's got a lot of international experience. So we know a lot of people who have had decades of relationships with Mr. Tillerson. And I'm also really encouraged, Rosemary, by the comments that were made by Rick Perry, uh, the former yeah. governor of Texas, during his confirmation hearings, when he talked about climate change and the human causes of climate change. And he was proud of his own record as governor and supporting alternate sources of energy, particularly wind power. So he shows Didn't that, that seem like a radical evolution, though, both by him and Scott Pruitt, that they suddenly had realized climate change may have been caused by, by man? Well, you don't think that that seemed like a, uh, a, like a sudden change in tune I, for both I, of them I'm, to say that? I, I just care about what they want to do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care about the inspiration from a change of heart. So uh, you just have to judge the administration by what it does. Yeah. And meanwhile, before all of these decisions are set, we've established what I think is a rational, intelligent network of people in the United States and not just in government, but in organizations, mm -hmm. and not only in the federal government, but in state governments, sure. that on the issues of energy and climate change are very important. So if Keystone is back on the table, and yeah. presumably it is to yeah. some extent, how quickly, you know, we don't know, what, what do you do? Do you, do you push for that? Yeah, yeah. we have been in favor of it since we have been elected. We were uh, disappointed when the Obama administration quashed it. Uh, all of the approvals necessary are in place north of the border. No. Uh, so uh, TransCanada will have to decide whether it wants to reapply and proceed. 
Uh, and I'm sure that if uh, the president gives a positive signal, that will be motivation. Uh, and we're supportive of the project. We think it's good for Canada. But you want these things to happen with uh, a sustainable economy, with yes. a carbon tax in place. Yeah. Um, is there any concern from you, from others, that if we put our carbon tax in place and we move in this direction, and they are doing the opposite, we're certainly not hurtling towards a carbon tax, right. that we are somehow uh, allowing ourselves to become less competitive? I think that we have a chance to be very competitive in renewable energy, relying on innovators and entrepreneurs and the ingenuity of Canadians, and by the way, in Western Canada in particular. People forget that it was innovation that created the possibility of developing the oil sands in the first place. And we have a lot of faith that uh, with private leadership and public partnership uh, that there will be new technologies and they're developing rapidly. Yeah. So when we talk about you have to have one conversation of environmental stewardship and economic growth, that's real and it's happening right now. So you're, you're st I, I understand all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes to try and build relationships. You personally, what's the yeah. thing you're going to do that's different than you would that you would have done with the Obama administration? What's the one thing you're going to do to approach this differently, to go in differently? Or are you going to sell it differently? There are changes in administration every four years or every eight years. Governments change, ministers change, values change a little less quickly. And as the Prime Minister has said, and as I truly believe, that our job is to promote the Canadian interest and Canadian values and look for the convergence of those values with our partners around the world. And the United States is our most important trading partner, which makes the convergence of those values so important for Canada and for the Canadian economy. But do you think and you'll think have to come the, down here more often, maybe? Oh, yeah, I expect so. Yeah. I expect so. I was first here, by the way, this very spot uh, with my friend Gary Dewar, yeah. whom, as you know, was Premier of Manitoba, and I'm a Manitoban. And I was with a business delegation, really, in this very spot, which oddly is a metaphor for Canada-U.S. relations because we have the best perch. Yeah. This is the best line to Capitol Hill. Uh, this is a place where an awful lot of people in Washington wanted to be today. Uh, I don't think only because it's the best perch to see what's going on, but also because there's a recognition on both sides of the border of just how important this relationship is. Okay. Good luck with all that. Thank you. Nice of you to make the time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Pleasure. We got lots more from Washington. The power panel will be back after this. And of course, we'll continue to monitor. Now there are helicopters in the parade. It's the strangest parade I've ever seen. Anyway, the oath of office is only actually 35 words long, but it's possibly the most important words Donald Trump has ever uttered. Here's a look back at the presidents who have said those words in the past. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, Harry S. Truman, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Yeah!
mothers and children trapped in poverty in our inner cities, rusted out factories scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation, an education system flush with cash, but which leaves our young and beautiful students deprived of all knowledge. And the crime, and the gangs, and the drugs that have stolen too many lives and robbed our country of so much unrealized potential. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. Welcome back to a special edition of Power and Politics, live from the Canadian Embassy in Washington. The inaugural parade ongoing. We're about an hour behind schedule, so we'll continue to keep an eye on that. But the power panel is here, too, to help me dig through some of the comments that the president made for the first time as president. Paul Wells, Aaron Weary in Ottawa, Louisa Savage, and Alex Panetta here with me at the embassy. Aaron, you were the one who wanted to talk about this the most, so you go first. What did you, because Peter Mansbridge made the point, too, that that's probably the line, right? You know, in, in these speeches, you look for a line that people remem re will remember. That probably is it, but maybe not for the reasons that people want it to be. Uh, how, how surprising was it to hear such a dark description of the country in a, in a speech like that today? I, it, I mean, the phrase American carnage is the one that leaps out from the speech. I mean, I think it was interesting both in that, you know, that is uh, uh, what Donald Trump apparently sees in America, and I think it's what many of his fiercest critics see as what's happening right now. Uh, you know, it, the, the sort of the very negative uh, portrayal of America that he gave, I think, goes back to his convention speech when it was he was almost dystopic in, in how he described the United States. Uh, and, you know, part of that, <clears throat> I don't want to exaggerate, I don't want to go, I don't want to say he was really that far off what we've heard in the past necessarily from American presidents. You know, American presidents, whenever they're inaugurated, they say that the country is in trouble or that there are major problems with the country that now they are going to address and solve or haven't been addressed and will now be addressed. Um, it, you know, so it's not that far, it, 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 in that regard, it's not that far off the norm, but it was presented in such a way that was far more uh, stark, far more populist. Uh, there was no, with a couple, a couple maybe side of minor exceptions, there was no reaching here for for poetry or, or, or sort of soaring oratory. It was very... Yeah. Uh, it was Trumpian, essentially, uh, and I, I thought it was it was interesting in that it was. I would guess it was probably the most populist uh, inaugural address that we've we've probably ever heard. Although you know why we would have expected poetry all of a sudden when that hasn't been. You know, I'm not saying you expected it, but you're, you're right. There were no grand statements, no quote quotes from previous presidents. Alex Swanson. Yeah, his, his supporters don't want poetry. I've, I mean, I've talked to some people who support Trump, and I've asked them very often this question. I'd say, do you want someone to govern well, or do you want to kick some butt? <laughs> do you want to kick some butt? you want to kick the butts of the people who've, who've hurt the middle class? Yeah. Who, yeah. And I, almost all the time, the answer is the latter. And <clears throat> the question, and I was speaking with someone on the mall today who said, uh, who believes that coal jobs can come back. She's going to get coal jobs back in Kentucky, where she's from. Coal jobs. Coal jobs. Even though China is shutting down coal. And money. even though natural gas right. is cheaper yeah. and clearer. Yeah. Okay, but I think it's a good thing that Trump is now focusing attention on that question of what happened to the middle class in this country. That's good. But now the question, the conversation is going to move to its logical next step, which is what happened? Why did it happen? And, uh, and uh, President Obama, well, former President Obama, mm -hmm. first time I've mm -hmm. ever said that, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, addressed that in, in, a, in his farewell speech. For, uh, the majority of jobs lost now are lost to robots, not the Chinese. And, and, and the next step, Uber now, which is killing taxi jobs, yeah. pretty soon those taxi drivers driving for Uber are going to lose their jobs to automated cars, which is one of the, I think it's the top job for, for working class men in this country, you transport trucks and, and cabs. What do you do with that? So then the logical next step is what policy solutions do governments uh, adopt? Now, there are already this year, there are a couple of different countries uh, 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 testing wage subsidies. Marco Rubio, who's very conservative, is talking about wage subsidies here. I'm not sure what that uh, that's ultimately going to be, the final yeah. uh, solution for this problem. But I think the we're, we're moving towards a conversation that we need to have. It, it, that's so interesting, because the, the point that Christia Freeland made to me, Paul, was, oh, but you notice how we're talking about the same thing when it comes to the middle class, a as though this is, you know, the one common bond. And I, I you know, I don't know, Paul, whether you, whether you agree with what Alex is saying, but it's interesting that 
for Trump, that is a, a, a dark place to be right now, the United States, middle class, USA. I'm not sure it's the same for, for the middle class in Canada, but you go. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fair for Canadians to focus on the bilateral trade relationship. It is uh, realistic for Canadian officials to worry about NAFTA. But I promise you that if this guy is still president in four years, uh, even for Canada, NAFTA will be the, le the least of our worries. Um, it's interesting he talks about American carnage. President Trump last night was at the Lincoln Memorial. If he had cared to, he could have turned around and read the text of Lincoln's second inaugural address, which is written on the side of the wall of that memorial. Um, I raise that because Lincoln gave that address during the, the peak moment of American carnage in the history of that republic, and the tone of what he said could not have been more different. It's not that Lincoln's speech was more heroic. It was less heroic. Lincoln made no claims for his own virtue. He made no predictions about the future. He understood that serious problems require serious approaches. And maybe one day, if someone reads that address to President Trump, he might learn something. Louisa? Well, I thought it was very striking that he took this tone at a time when, you know, jobs are being created, the economy has found its footing, and um, things are generally doing much better than they were eight years ago when President Obama took office in the middle of a financial crisis where it was unclear where the bottom was going to be. People were losing their houses to foreclosure. Uh, people were being laid off in, in, in masses. And, and the president then took a much more uplifting tone. But it, it's, on the other hand, it fits very well with Trump's, um, his, his appeal to people who feel that their particular communities have been left behind. And, and that's why we saw so many um, states in the so-called Rust Belt turn to Trump, because there was a feeling that, oh, that's great that New York City and San Francisco are doing so well, but what about us here in these small and medium-sized cities? I think this is really important. It's a huge challenge to Democrats going forward because in just two short years, there will be midterm elections and there will be a lot of Senate seats up for grabs, particularly in that region. And Democrats are not expected to do very well. Um, this is a huge challenge for them to figure out what do they say, what do they say to those people when, when Donald Trump appeals to them and says, we're going to do a, a massive infrastructure push. The second point, I'd like to go back to your interview um, on energy. Yeah. Um, I was speaking with someone today who had been running Trump's energy transition, and he said something really interesting. I, I was asking him who he thought would be the point person on the infrastructure package should it come together inside the White House. And he said a lot of people expected that it would be put under transportation because they think highways, they think um, transportation. but. But his prediction was it would be put under energy because um, when Trump thinks infrastructure, it's not just highways and bridges, but it's also pipelines. Interesting. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And, and on the issue of, of Canadian energy, I think it's notable that his incoming Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, who was head of ExxonMobil, well, ExxonMobil, a large part of their um, oil reserves are actually located in Canada. And so I think um, we're getting a Secretary of State here who's quite familiar um, with Canada's role in, in North American energy. All important points. Okay, uh, you can see that the inaugural parade has finally wrapped up about an hour and or more behind schedule. And the uh, first family and the vice president's family will now make their way, I guess, back to their residences. Apparently, we're, we're told, um, well, it's being reported that Donald Trump has not yet even entered the Oval Office. So I guess they're going to get themselves sorted, uh, gussied up, as it were, and make their way to three inaugural balls. We're going to take a short break. we got one more round with the power panel when we come back. But first, of course, the former president, and Alex is right, it does feel weird to say that. It was eight years after all. Barack Obama was on hand today for the official transition of power. And then he delivered an emotional farewell speech at Joint Base Andrews to some of his staff. Take a look at that. <clears throat> Throughout this process, Michelle and I, we've just been your front men and women. Uh, we have been the face, sometimes the voice, out front on the TV screen or in front of the microphone, but this has never been about us. It has always been about you.
Hey, everybody, back with a special inauguration edition of Power and Politics with Paul Wells, Aaron Weary, Louisa Savage, and Alex Panetta. I'm going to do the impossible and ask for you guys to all weigh in on either what you think has changed as of today, what you think Trump will do first, what Canada should think of. I frame it however you want. But, but the thing that we need to keep in mind, this is the first day. I'm not sure he's actually doing much over the weekend. He sort of said that he's going to, I think, start officially working on Monday. But anyway, what, uh, Paul, why don't you start us off? What do, you, what do you think this, what do you think happens now? What's the first thing that, that we have to watch out for? I think it's all going to happen at once. The, the, the striking thing about his speech today is that the, 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 the scale of his ambition is vast and the, and the time scale that he yeah. is immediate. I mean, this, this American carnage en ends right here and right now. Yeah. Um, you know, give him a few more days than that. But I think by summer, this will be a presidency of either striking accomplishment or utter chaos. You won't have to wait long. Aaron. Uh, you know, Donald Trump was regarded as a candidate, uh, a politician who was outside the norms of American democracy. Uh, and now we get to see sort of how American democracy grapples with that uh, and how he grapples with American democracy. Uh, I'm very interested to see what the, uh, the pushback is, not so much from the legislature, not so much from, uh, you know, Republicans, but from, from the left, from progressives in the United States. Uh, uh, possibly even uh, there seem to be hints of it from Barack Obama himself. Mm. Uh, it, it will be interesting. It almost feels like we're embarking on a bit of an experiment. And, uh, I guess I'm interested to see how it turns out. Louisa? Well, I would like to pull the lens back and, and basically see that I think we're entering a new world order here. We have a, a president that's talking about protectionism, that's questioning the value of a rules-based trading system in, in Asia to, to him in China. He's questioning the value of NATO as an alliance. He said in his speech, why should we be protecting other people's borders if we're not protecting our own? He's questioning just the very basic premises that the world has been functioning on. Mm. Um, and he's not the only one. I think across Europe, we see these populist movements and leaders taking hold. Um, and most recently, Angela Merkel, who, who seems so solid uh, in Germany, I think is going to be challenged after these terrorist attacks there, after she took in so many Syrian refugees. And, and there's been a huge, what used to be an anti-EU movement there has become an anti-immigration movement. So, and this, the possibility of Trump remaking the relationship with Vladimir Putin and, and Russia is, is just, you know, a complete wild card where that leads. So I think the big picture here is even bigger than Trump and it's potentially historic and, and momentous. Over to you. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I'd, I'd strongly suggest that people be, that we try to be a little bit more decent with, uh, with people with whom we disagree, whether it's your political opponents or anything else. Uh, otherwise, I was on the mall today and I heard people cheering or chanting, lock her up uh, for the person who lost Still. the election. Yeah. I heard people booing when a, uh, an opposition politician on stage called for national unity and read a, a letter from a dead soldier from the Civil War. Uh, you have a foreign government hacking into emails and spreading information about a, uh, an election candidate and everyone else is cheering on the foreign government uh, because they disagree, they hate their opponents so much, and I don't want to see that happen in my country. Well, we have a big march coming up tomorrow, yeah. which will be the other side of the spectrum, you know, booing and chanting and... and, and yeah. And so anyway, it's not it's mutually a, exclusive, right? It's, yeah. it's not a moment of coming together, that's, exactly. that's for and, sure. Yeah, we can all do better. Well, on that poetic note, on a day when there was little poetry, Alex gives us some. Thank you all. <laughs> Alex Panetta, Louisa oh. Savage, the fellows back at home, Aaron Weary and Paul Wells. I'll come back, maybe. Uh, otherwise, Aaron, you can take that chair, right? Thanks. You're ready for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, have a good weekend. Thank you all. I appreciate your insight today. Cheers. Past U.S. presidents and their wives were on hand for the inauguration today. And, of course, that included the defeated candidate that we're just talking about there, Hillary Clinton. The cameras did cut to her quite frequently during the ceremony, and she certainly uh, she was certainly putting on a brave face. I'm not sure she was enjoying herself. Although President Trump didn't mention her during his inaugural address, he did thank Clinton later at the luncheon. Take a look at that. Because I was very honored, very, very honored, when I heard that President Bill Clinton and Secretary Hillary Clinton was coming today. And I think it's appropriate to say, and I'd like you to stand up. I'd like you to stand up.
And honestly, there's nothing more I can say because I have a lot of respect for those two people. So thank you all for being here. And uh, we're going to have four great years, hopefully, of peace and prosperity. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, together, we will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Welcome back to Power and Politics and our spectacular set here with the Capitol building behind us. The inauguration, the inaugural parade is also over now and people are starting to arrive for the inaugural balls. Megan Fitzpatrick is at the site of one of them now and she joins us now. Okay, what's the mood on the ground now? I guess people are starting to get there. Give us a sense of it, Megan. Yeah, the guests are definitely coming in now, Rosie, and there are a lot of men in uniforms and some women in uniform, too, of course, and uh, lots of ladies dressed up in very fancy, uh, beautiful ball gowns. I've had a chance to talk to a few people in the crowd just for a few minutes, and they're really excited to be here. Many of them are current members of the military, and I'm told that that really was a focus for the invite list, that this isn't really, uh, you know, the big bosses that are invited here. There will be some of the, you know, top-level uh, military leaders here tonight, uh, but the emphasis on the guest list was everyday uh, Americans who uh, are members of the military. And so uh, some of them are telling me they are excited to see their new boss because, of course, Trump is coming here not just as uh, the new president, but as commander in chief. Uh, so a lot of them are saying uh, that they feel honored to be here, um, particularly because this ball specifically is to honor members of the armed services. And it's only one of the three official inaugural balls. And Trump and his committee decided to have it specifically to honor, honor the troops. And we know he 
talked a lot about that during the campaign, and that's partly why he wanted to have this kind of event. So, yeah, it's a festive mood here. The drinks are flowing. The food will be out soon. There's music playing in the background. Later, there'll be some live entertainment. But for now, people are just still trickling in uh, and filling up the room. So give us a sense of what the new president and, and his wife, the first lady, will be doing over the course of the evening then. Right, so this will be one of the three balls that they're attending. The other two are at a different location at the Washington Convention Center. Those ones are called the Liberty Ball and the Freedom Ball. And then uh, this one is the Salute to the Armed, uh, armed Services. And once they get here, uh, they are expected to do a photo op upstairs in one of the rooms behind me with some of the leaders of the military. Uh, and then they'll come downstairs and there'll be some dancing. Um, but it's not just going to be Trump and Melania dancing. I'm told that each of them, plus Mike Pence, Vice President Mike Pence and his wife, will be dancing with members of the military and each branch of the military will be represented. So Trump, I'm told, is going to dance uh, with a woman from the Navy and Melania will be dancing with someone from the Army and maybe they'll switch up their partners at some point, but that'll be <laughs> part of the entertainment on the stage behind me. And uh, there'll also be some bands playing, like I said. Um, and then there's also going to be a live feed uh, on some of the screens coming in of troops who are stationed in Afghanistan. Uh, so there'll be, we're told, some interaction between the troops who are here uh, getting a night off and I talked to one guy who had been literally preparing for months to organize inauguration weekend and they said he said that he got a night off uh, to come and enjoy the evening with his wife so he was happy about that um, but yeah there's troops here in this room and they'll be interacting with some of the troops who are stationed abroad so big focus on the military yeah. Uh, and yeah a lot of them just excited to see their new boss they kept saying he's our new boss not just our new president but our new boss and, and lots of symbolism in all those choices, of course, that, that I'm sure people will talk about. Now, tomorrow is going to be just as busy, but in a, an entirely different way. What, what can you tell us about the big women's march tomorrow? We are expecting it to start around 10 a.m. tomorrow, uh, but I think people are traveling on buses overnight to get here to D.C. for it. Many people are already in town, uh, and 200,000 people are expected or more. So we are going to see the streets of downtown Washington packed yet again for a second straight day, but for a different reason, obviously. Uh, the event did start out as a reaction to the election result, but kind of grew into this big movement and an organized event, and we are expecting celebrities to be here, uh, including Amy Schumer, Katy Perry, uh, Gloria Stein, I'm expected to speak at it. They're going to they're gonna talk for a while. There'll be a stage set up with some, uh, it's going to be kind of like a rally atmosphere, and then they will march through the streets for that. Uh, it'll be a big event, and we'll be covering it, of course, on all platforms for CBC. Okay, thanks, Megan. Appreciate all your hard work for us over the past couple of days. That's the CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick here in Washington. There were some more familiar faces at today's inauguration, as is tradition, of course. All the living past U.S. presidents attend, except, of course, George Bush Sr., who is uh, still hospitalized uh, with pneumonia, but, but doing better. Let's take a look at who we saw. The 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter and Mrs. Rosalind Carter. The 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, and the Honorable Hillary Rodham Clinton. The 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush and Mrs. Laura Bush. The Honorable Barack H. Obama and the Vice President, Joseph R. Biden.
Welcome back to the uh, terrace of the Canadian Embassy. It's actually just outside the ambassador's office here in Washington. We've been getting a lot of different opinions and perspectives over the past couple of days. We asked some of our guests, what's your one piece of advice for the Canadian government now that they are dealing with the Trump administration? Here's what they told us. What I would say to the leaders of the Canadian government is you get the big house, you get the big car, you get the pl big plane, and in return for that, you're now going to have to eat some toads for your country. Take a deep breath. Uh, I would ask you to keep uh, uh, the same open-mindedness and the same respect uh, that you had for the Obama administration going in. Don't react to every uh, little event in Washington over the course of the next month. Uh, take your time, be deliberate, be thoughtful, uh, develop those individual relationships. Direct conversations, and I would encourage uh, the Trump administration and uh, Trudeau's administration to have conversations where they agree. Let's give them a chance to perform, reach out, uh, offer your assistance, uh, continue the dialogue, but don't prejudge. More time spent with direct conversation would benefit everybody. Sneak into town, don't make a big deal out of it, meet your colleagues, your counterparts, have a cup of coffee or a Molson and uh, and, and uh, develop those relationships. I think world leaders, I think uh, even within Congress, you need to talk directly to, to folks about what it is you're saying, what it is you're trying to depict out there and not depend and not let media speak for you entirely. Uh, Donald Trump responds to personal flattery. He is not motivated by state interests, but by personal interests. Um, so it is going to be the job of the leaders of the Canadian government to flatter him outrageously. And when they begin to be sick to their stomach, that's when they're beginning to be in the neighborhood of the amount of fat flattery that is required. CBC News Network will, of course, have much more coverage tonight and through the weekend. Peter Armstrong and Ian, Han Ian Hannah Mansing will pick up the story over the next few hours here on CBC News Network. And, of course, our chief correspondent, Peter Mansbridge, will have a special edition of The National at 9 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. on your local CBC station. We've got lots more throughout the weekend, too, as we watch the Women's March on Washington and as we track these first 100 days of Donald Trump's presidency. Okay. It's been a crazy fun week here for Power and Politics for Inauguration Day, wrapping up two whirlwind shows here in Washington. Thanks to the amazing crew behind the scenes that have helped us look this good for the past couple of days. And of course, to our Power and Politics team at home. I'm Rosemary Barton. I'll see you all back in Ottawa on Monday. On the Money is next with lots more coverage of Donald Trump's first few hours in office. The inaugural balls continue. Stay tuned to CBC News Network. Thanks for watching. Bye. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend.